everyone. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the ESCP Business School Bachelor in Management Masterclass, Understanding Currency Exchange Rates. My name is Tania Fernandez, and I'm in charge of marketing and communication at the Madrid campus. I would like to present our speaker for today, Professor Dr. Jaime Peluque. Hello, Jaime. I hope you're doing great. Hey, Tania. Hello. Hi. Well, Jaime Luque is an Associate Professor of Economics at ESCP Business School, where he holds the BNP Paribas Professorship in Real Estate and serves as Director of the Monaco Real Estate Tech Innovation Program. He's also the Academic Director for the MSc in Real Estate, the MSc in Hospitality and Tourism Management, and the Institute of Real Estate Finance and Management. Prior to joining ESCP in July 2018, he was an Associate Professor of Real Estate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Business. Jaime's main academic research applies general equilibrium theory to financial and real estate markets. He has conducted research on the consequence of repo and re hypothecation on security pricing and market pressures. The line of research evolved towards the understanding of lev leverage the dynamics, security bubbles, anomalies in currency markets, and banks' portfolio re rebalancing in sovereign debt crisis. My English teaching specializations include real estate finance, real estate economics, urban economics, and macroeconomics. He has taught in the MBA, MSc, and BBA programs. Jaime is the recipient of the 2017 Ideas Worth Teaching Award by the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program for his educational innovations. Well, this masterclass is actually a little taste of what our bachelor students are going to get next year at ESCP Business School. And this is going to be actually a really interactive masterclass. So all of you are going to be participating to, through the Mentimeter tool. If you have never used it, I will advise you that if you're on a desktop or a PC to open a separate window in your browser, or if you prefer, use a separate device, either a, either a mobile phone or a tablet, and put on your browser www.menti.com. If we, I'm going too fast, don't worry, because you're going to have it in Jaime's presentation. On, on top of each of, of Jaime's questions, you're going to see a code that you're going to have to write down on the menti.com web. Don't worry, we're going to drive you through it through the presentation. But, uh, well, what I wanted to say is that it's going to be really dynamic, so please enjoy the, the webinar to the most. If you have any questions, please write them down in the question box, and Professor Luque will be happy to answer them at the end of the webinar. So we encourage you to participate so that you get the most out of this class. Thank you, and enjoy the webinar. I leave the floor to Professor Jaime. Thank you. Well, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Tania, for, for this great introduction. Uh, before starting the slides, uh, I, I'm going to say hello to everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I know it's been a crazy time, but uh, what I wanted to, to say are two things before starting the slides. The first thing is that uh, just a small correction on Tania's um, uh, introduction. Uh, at University of Wisconsin-Madison, I was assistant professor um, in, the, in the real estate department in the business school. And the, the second thing is uh, I'm going to start sharing my, 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 my slides. I hope that you guys can see uh, all the slides now. Um, if not, always you can chat and Tania can, can see what your comments. My, my screen is full mode, so I'm now seeing the slides only. And um, well, so I'm, the, the next steps now, it's uh, for me to start telling you a little bit about what I'm going to talk today. Uh, it's going to be a short presentation about a topic that in macroeconomics, you, you guys want to start the bachelor, uh, macroeconomics is a very important course as, as others. As, uh, but macroeconomics is important because it's going gonna, it's gonna to teach you very, how to understand the world, how to navigate uncertainty. And one of the most important topics for business managers, so you guys in charge of a big company, not now, but maybe in 20 years from now or in 10 years from now, 
it's uh, to deal with um, is to deal with exchange rates. Uh, you are gonna have a super international profile from many countries. You have been you, by then you have been traveling and living in in countries speaking different languages, and all this enriches your profile. And it's natural that you may end up uh, being in charge of big international companies and. It, being in charge for an international company means that you're going to do business in different countries and possibly these countries are going to have different currencies and you have to understand the implications of exchange rates because you can have like huge losses or or you can earn a lot of money if you do well if you understand if you anticipate the movements in exchange rates if you operate in euros and uh, you are then going and expanding your business in, in the united states you have to understand what are the implications of the dollar appreciating or depreciating with respect to the euro. So um, it's it's not an easy topic, and it's possible that you will not under, fully understand 100% of what I will be telling you guys today. But this is the idea is that you get a flavor of how a bachelor uh, class uh, is going to look like. And we are going to do today's class online uh, as, uh, with new technologies, and uh, we are going to make it very interactive. Okay, so uh, let let me start and uh, let tell you a little bit about what I think it's a very important question, which is how exchange rates are determined. So once you go to the airport and you're going to change your 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 euros for say Swiss francs or dollars if you go to America, uh, th there, is, there is a market behind that and there is what we call supply and what we call demand. And once they interact, they, they are traders buying and selling and they agree on a price. That price is the exchange rate. And we, we need to understand how we pin down these prices. And I mean, the, probably what I'm gonna say to right now is one of the most important notions in economics and it applies very well to uh to this lesson today in macroeconomics which is the notion of scarcity everything that is scarce the price goes up right price is high everything that is abundant price goes low and think about gold if if there is a war and the only kind of a uh, commodity that you can use to basically get money or exchange things for other things, maybe gold. And in, in a war, people are scared and people like they're in a rush and they might be willing to pay a lot of money to get the gold or whatever, right? So gold might be scarce by, by then. And when scarcity increases, so there is less gold up there, the price is going to go up. And once we get out of the war, things go back to normality and so on, right? The, the gold price should go down because by then there's be producers selling to the country more supply. So gold prices go down. So this, this notion, we are gonna apply the notion of scarcity to exchange rates. It's very, very powerful notion, scarcity. Okay, so uh, let me, the only slide that I need to, um, well, let, let's, I, I prepare this one first. So uh, let's practice this more interactive online session with a question that has nothing to do with exchange rates. And then I will go and explain you the only slide that is more about more theoretical context that you should understand. And you tell me that, okay? So please go, those that didn't do that before, go to menti.com and then you enter this code 35460 and then you you, you enter the, the country you are from you might be from two countries so you, you you write the two of them and right now you can see that the people that have been answering questions right now are from india mexico switzerland morocco monaco japan sweden china hungary spain germany Luxembourg, Lebanon, and, and possibly many others. Okay, so only those of you that have joined today's question, you represent these countries like Mexico, uh, India, like it's, 
all over the world, right? And this is ESCP. It's a beautiful experience. And that's what I was saying before, that your profile will be very unique. You will be very international and you will be a very good candidate to work for an international company. And you have to deal with uncertainty related to exchange rates because you will do business in, in terms of different currencies, okay? So that's, that's the first question. Uh, now I'm gonna, uh, uh, this is the only slide that I have. It's a little bit more theoretical. I don't know if you guys had economics or not before. Don't worry too much if you didn't understand fully this slide, but what, what you can see here is like two, two lines, right? Like two blue lines. One is the, what we call the D, the demand. The demand and, and, and the S one is gonna be the supply. And, and then uh, in the horizontal axis, in the X axis, we have the, the amount of sterling pounds. The sterling pound is the currency in the United Kingdom. So the, the point is that as we basically are gonna uh, decrease the, the, the quantity, the, the quantity, uh, I'm sorry, as we are gonna decrease the price, you see, as we decrease the price in the vertical axis, we have the price, right? The, 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 dollar, the, the, the price of pounds. As we decrease the price, basically people are gonna, the, the people that wanna buy that because the price is lower, they wanna buy more. That's why as we decrease the price, the quantity is increasing, that's the demand. Now, what about supply? Well, as we de decrease the price, the supply, the quantity of that currency is gonna decrease. So basically those that are selling that product, in this case, it's a currency, they are willing to sell less because they get less money for their, for their, for their currency. So they, they may get less dollars for each pound they sell, okay? So once demand and supply interact, there is what we call an equilibrium. And, and, and this equilibrium basically is an agreement by the market. It's, invisible hand of Alan Smith. That is like without any regulation, individuals, because they are free, they agree on something. And, and that something is an exchange rate. And this is basically what you, once you go to the airport, that's what you see, okay? That's the number you see, this exchange rate. So this is basically the notion behind that. And I want to practice with you this idea of scarcity in different contexts. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you questions and then I'm gonna tell you, go ahead and, and type your, your answer, enter your answer. So, but before, before you enter your answer, you have to wait that I explain some things, okay? So let's go to the first question. I explain things, you wait a little bit, and then I say, go ahead, enter your answer, okay? So let's start. The, 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 the first question is, does a lower rate of inflation in the United Kingdom than a broad cost and appreciation of the pound. So what does it mean? Before you answer, uh, let, let me explain a little bit. So in, in a country, it can be the United Kingdom, right? You, you have what is called inflation, which means prices go up. So if suddenly, if you, if you drink beer, the, the price of beer goes up. If you are gonna buy cars in the UK, the price of cars goes up. That We call that inflation, okay? So if the rate of inflation uh, it's gonna basically uh, go down. That's a lower rate of inflation. So if, if prices in the United Kingdom goes, go down, right? Does it, does it cause an appreciation of the pound? So what we wanna understand here is if foreigners, so people outside, right? There's a question that said yes, so, but the rest of you, please wait, okay? Uh, so what we wanna understand is whether people outside United Kingdom, think about Europeans, that we have euros, and we, if we wanna buy in the UK a car, we have basically to sell our euros and buy pounds, right? So when do we wanna do that? We wanna do that if basically it's very attractive what we are gonna have, to, or we're gonna, we are gonna buy in the UK. So what we are saying is, if prices in the UK are, going, are going down, is it attractive? Yes, it's very attractive. So Europeans are gonna exchange their, their, their euros and they are gonna buy pounds and they are going to, with that, those pounds, they're gonna buy the car. So the question is, does, it, does the pound appreciate with respect to the euro? So there are, there are like uh, some people that are saying yes, 
Uh, the rest of you, uh, feel free to uh, now say yes, no, and I don't know, and I, I will explain a little bit more, uh, which is very reasonable if, 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 if some of you don't, don't know. Okay, so what, what we can see is that the majority of you have chosen yes, and this is the correct answer. Uh, this is really exciting. You guys get it like very quickly, and uh, congratulations. So the, 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 the idea behind that is that cars become cheaper, Europeans sell their euros and buy pounds. So the pound becomes scarcer, right? Because more people want to have their hands on pounds. Why? Because they want to buy cars, UK cars. So this notion of scarcity of the pound is going to lead to the pound to appreciate with respect to the euro. So the pound becomes scarcer, so the pound appreciates. So yes, it appreciates. Very good. I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, what about the next one? So that's a fall in UK incomes relative to those abroad cause an appreciation of the pound. So wait, wait a second. So don't answer. Uh, we are saying that now people in the UK are poorer, so they have less money. And now we want to understand whether the pound appreciates with respect to the euro. Now, now everything is in terms of British citizens with less money in their pockets, and some of them buy. British, British goods and others buy, say, European goods, like, say, goods from France, right? And to buy goods from France, they need euros. So, but because they are poorer, they are going to be able to exchange less pounds for euros. So there is going to be less demand for euros, right? So that's it. Up. So this fall in UK incomes, now, what do you think? It leads to an appreciation or depreciation of the pound? If, if it's an appreciation, you say yes. Okay, now you have time. I think I, 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 I should, I'm gonna speak more for like a couple of, of one minute, okay? So I let you think. Okay, very, very good. So what we, what we can see is that most of you think that actually there is no appreciation of the pound, which is the same as saying that there is a depreciation of the pound, right, with respect to the euro. And the story is what kind of what I was saying before, like people are poor in the UK, so they have less money in their pockets. So if they want to buy, say, a Fr French wine, and it's French wine is in euros, so they are going to change their pounds to buy euros. But because they have less pounds, they're going to buy less euros. So there is less demand for pounds. So basically, it's not as scarce as in other situations. So the answer is no. Very good. Uh, we are going to practice. And it's very normal that some of you don't understand 100% or you understand some questions, but not others. But what I was saying before, before is that the idea is that you get an idea of what it looks like uh, at one of our classes. So. Let's, let, let's go ahead and uh, look at this question. So the question is saying, does a better investment prospects in the UK than abroad cause an appreciation of the pound? So let me explain before you answer. Uh, we are saying that now in the, the, in the UK, things are looking very good. Like, like you want to put your money in the UK, right? So if, if, you are, if you are European or American and the UK, is, then it is doing very good. So you, you want to change your money, your euros or your dollars, and buy pounds because you're going to put your money in the UK, right? So there is a lot of demand for pounds, which means that the demand for the pound is going to increase. And that means scarcity of the pound. So what do you think? It's at least an appreciation of the pound. So we are seeing that more and more people are saying yes. Yes, it leads to an appreciation of the pound. And that's correct, right? It's what I was kind of. Uh, implicitly saying like now we, everyone wants pounds because they wanna they wanna buy uh, they wanna buy goods in the UK or they wanna invest in the UK and for that they need pound they need pounds so the pound appreciates with respect to say the euro uh, so one more um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, if speculators believe that the pound will appreciate with respect to the dollar, 
So people think like you read financial times and, and everyone is saying the pound is gonna appreciate with respect to the dollar. Do you think that the pound will end appreciating? What do you think? Yes, no, I don't know. What is your answer? We can see that like there are some brave students saying yes, which is correct. Yes, uh, I mean, like this is the, the idea of self-fulfilling prophecies. If the market is feeling that things are going are doing very good in, in the UK, so money is going there and, and basically people want to invest or buy goods from the UK and that leads to a scarcity of the pound, it appreciates. Very good, so excellent. So let me go ahead, ne next slide. Uh, now, think about in the United Kingdom that goods, be, like whatever they do, like say cars, they become more competitive, right? In terms of quality, like the speed, whatever. So cars in the UK become very good, right? So the same for other, other goods in the UK. So do you think that the pound is gonna appreciate? And I'm not, I'm not gonna help you now, what do you think? Very good. So some of you, the, the, the brave ones are saying yes, and that, that's correct, right? It's like, uh, like if they are better the cars or they are they are cheaper, whatever reason, like people are gonna change their euros and buy pounds, and with those pounds they are gonna buy the cars because they are very competitive, they are very good, and because they are buying pounds, the pound becomes scarce. And become, because the pound becomes scarce, it appreciates with respect to other currencies. So the answer is yes. Excellent. Very good. Um, so now I'm going to play a video, very, very short video. And we are going to talk about something slightly different. It's starting to become more complicated. So don't be scared, right? But this is, uh, I students love videos. And uh, so this is gonna, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share a video and I'm gonna stop the video at some point and ask you a question, okay? So it's the, 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 the person who, uh, that is interviewed is a very famous uh, American who wrote a book on debt crisis. And he's basically uh, putting together the idea of debt crisis. So crisis that imply that there's a lot of debt and people don't pay debt with exchange rates. And he's gonna talk about the case of Turkey. Turkey has, has the lira and uh, the, basically we are gonna discuss that, okay? So that's, this is the context, let, let, let me play the video. Uh, it's gonna be like maximum four minutes uh, including discussions, okay? So let's go. You have a new book out, a template for understanding big debt crises. And Ray, to me, the underlying message of this book is that history is doomed to repeat itself. Have I got that right? Yeah, the everything happens over and over again for similar cause-effect relationships, right? So, and that, that, I mean, that, that sounds like an awfully depressing reality. Does it, does it, does it need to be a depressing reality? Well, I mean, it's like any reality. Uh, you know, you got to embrace the reality and know how to deal with it. Uh, you, yeah, there are debt cycles, and debt cycles provide great opportunities, and they provide real problems. So, very good. So, he's talking about the first term. He's talking about is debt cycles, and it is like a cycle, right? We go up and down, boom, bust, and what he's saying is that it's because we have a lot of debt that it explains a little bit of these cycles. And in some cases, the, 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 the boom and the bust is because of the debt cycle, right? Think about 2008 was what we call the, the, the great financial crisis. There was a lot of debt in terms of mortgages, like Americans, Europeans, everyone was borrowing money to buy a house. And, and 
there was too much debt. And at some point they weren't able to repay their debt. There was a lot of defaults and bankruptcies and the whole world became a mess. Financial markets collapsed. And that's an example of a, of a debt, of, of, of a debt crisis. And he's talking about debt cycles. Okay, so that, that's the first thing. Let, let me continue with the video. I, th I think it's just like a, a progression, a disease that progresses. And the reason I wrote the book um, is actually it was just a compendium of research that I wrote mostly before the financial crisis. And it's because I think it's essential for everybody to understand the sequence of events, the logical sequence of events that makes these all the same. So as you know, there's 48 of them in there. They all play out pretty much the same way, except there are inflationary and deflationary ones depending on the currency. But basically, I'm in 60 pages, I just want to convey that template. So let's talk about one of those two types of debt crises, the inflationary depression. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this is an, another very important concept, inflationary depression. Basically, depression means crisis, right? The stock market plummets, everything goes down. And, and uh, it's also seen inflationary. So it means that there is inflation, like prices go up and at the same time, markets go down. We call that type of crisis inflationary depression and it has implications on exchange rates. And he's gonna talk a little bit about that. Okay, so I just want to define what it means by inflationary depression. Is that what's playing out right now in Turkey, in Argentina, in emerging markets more broadly? Yeah, certainly. And this has all played out many times. This isn't the first time that Argentina has gone through it. It has a habit of going through it. And it's not the first time it's happened anywhere else. So you could follow it. I mean, basically, the big deal is whether the currency is denominated, the debt is denominated in your own currency or in your foreign currency. And when it's denominated in foreign currency, like these countries have a lot of dollar denominated debt, then it, they have a problem trying to service that dollar denominated debt. When the dollar goes up and the money they're earning is in local currency, then they don't have enough cash and then they get into that spiral and as a result of that, they have to print more money, the currency depreciates and it happens in a very mechanical way. Okay, so many, many concepts here. It takes, it would take this like many classes to go through every single concept, but what he, uh, a difference that he's making is like debt denominated in domestic currency or debt denominated in foreign currency. For example, like if you are a big multinational in, in Turkey, uh, you have liras, right? Because the, the currency in Turkey is the lira, the Turkish lira. But if you really want to borrow a lot of money, you usually go to the international market. And Usually that debt is denominated in dollars. So you have to, you're gonna borrow dollars and then you're gonna exchange those, those dollars for, for, for Turkish liras, right? So the, the point is that if, if there is a, what he's saying is suppose there is a crisis say in Turkey and, and the dollar becomes stronger, right? And, and the lira depreciates with respect to the dollar for whatever reason, some of the reasons we mentioned before, the point is that the lira is going to depreciate with respect to the US dollar. But the, their debt is denominated in dollars. So that means that they have to, that their debt goes up because the, their own currency is lira. So they have to exchange more liras to pay that debt. So the debt is more expensive for them. And at some point, they may go default. They say, I'm sorry, it's too high this debt. I, I will go bankrupt. And, and the company goes bankrupt. Um, so that's what he's saying. Like, it has it has implications whether the debt is denominated in your domestic currency, the lira, or in a foreign currency. In this case, is the dollar. So let's let's keep going. Go away. Most of the countries don't have reserve currencies don't have the debt denominated in their own currency and as a result most of their crises are of that sort and there's a dynamic as to how they complete the cycle in other words what happens is when the currency goes down in value essentially because of inflation and the like 
they wipe out the local currency debt. If you own the local currency debt, you're wiped out. You've evaluated 27 of these non-domestic currency crises in the book. So take what's happening today in Argentina, Turkey, and like I say, emerging markets more broadly, and compare it, if you would, to some of the things that we might remember. There are some people who are old enough to recall the peso crisis of 1994, the Asian currency crisis of 97, or perhaps the Russian debt default of 98, or the Argentine default of 2001. This looks most like what to you? Well, it, it looks like that. It looks like those because the currency depreciation um, then also raises the interest rate differential. And um, in the process of wiping out the local currency denominated debt because it's essentially monetized away, the currency becomes cheaper. All the crises are self-correcting mechanisms. So when the currency becomes cheaper, then it becomes more the balance of payments improves. Okay, very good. Uh, so basically, I'm um, uh, I'm going to start showing again my screen, and um, basically, I'm going to go back to my slides, uh, and this is where we were before, and we were playing that video. So, so this video of uh, Dalio Ray, he's an expert in in currency crisis. It's just a taste of what we do in class. We we take experts and. We, we basically talk about like these very important phenomena and and discussions that that uh, people and people discuss in real life and are very important for companies to survive. Okay, so he was at the very end. He was going more deeper, and I don't want to go there right now. It's I want to have a short class today. Uh, now, uh, if we go to next slide, this is where almost. Finishing, I have I think two or three more slides and I'm done. Uh, here, what a very very tricky and difficult question is: What central banks do, and what happens when central banks start to print money, right? So central banks, central bank of 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 European Central Bank in Europe, or the Bank of England, the central bank in United Kingdom. And so on, or, or the Federal Reserve in the United States, they may decide to print money. And what happens with the change rates? So basically, uh, if if there is more money, say, think about now the Federal Reserve in the United States, it's the central bank in the in, in in the United States. So the Federal Reserve, the Fed, they starts printing dollars. So what happens with the scarcity of the dollar? Is going to decrease, right? The dollar is going to become more abundant. There is someone that is printing dollars, so the dollar becomes more abundant. So the do the dollar is going to depreciate with respect to other currencies. That's what we were discussing before, right? So it's going to be a devaluation or depreciation of the dollar. And uh, sorry, I jumped the, the, the slide. And um, now now that there is this depreciation of the dollar, it has consequences on many different aspects of the economy, okay? But so far we wanted to, to make this clear. Uh, so now we have to talk about central banks and monetary policy and connection with exchange rates. Uh, the, 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 the last part is what would happen if, if we adopt a single currency? And, and that's another, another big topic that we cover in class. We discuss whether Adopting the euro, it's a good or a bad strategy. Uh, we are a European business school. It's a grand school in France. Uh, we have multi-campus. And sometimes we, we discuss the, the, the political matters in, in Europe. So just wanted to end the class here and, and to basically say like this story of determination of exchange rates, it applies to many other important discussions. Like one, for example, one of them is the, the concept of the, of the Euro and the future of the European Union. Okay, so with that, I, I'm done. I just want to, to thank you, all of you for your time and um, hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very brief taste of what you will see in class. You have amazing professor at ESCP, it's an amazing experience, 
and the best thing is also your, your classmates. You are going to enjoy it a lot, and I look forward to, to meeting you in person. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Jaime. It was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering if every, if anyone has any questions for Professor Jaime, please remember to write it down on the question box um, so we can read them out and, and just start our, our Q&A right now. I think we have a lot of Chai uh, students on the audience. I don't know, maybe Kai, maybe you want to compliment something. Well, I have a first question from Ivan. Um, regarding US, with the quantitative easing and the jobless people increasing, why hasn't the dollar dropped yet to 1.2? 1.2, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, wow, very, very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm impressed. Um, so, I mean, first thing is, uh, what is this QE, quantitative easing? So the QE is the, 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 the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank in the United States, is printing money it's, or injecting money to companies, is lending money to companies. So at the, at the end of the day, there is more money out there. And because there is more dollars, the dollar is gonna depreciate, right? That, that's the idea of, of scarcity abundance. If, if the central bank does this quantitative easing, program, there is more dollars out there. So the dollar is more abundant, the dollar depreciates. And, and he's asking, Ivan is asking if, why that is not going below 120? It's, it's, it's a great question. And, and the answer, in my opinion, is that we are living times of uncertainties. We are living one of the biggest financial crises since the Great Depression in the 30s, 1930s. And because we are living these days, people are putting their money in very secure currencies. And the, 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 the most secure currency in the world right now is the US dollar, right? And this is basically what in economics we call the apply to quality. People are flying, they are, they are putting, they changing their money and putting that money in, in, in dollars. Uh, um, so that's why even with QE, it's not depreciating as much as, as we could see. But also keep in mind that it's not only the Fed in the US that is printing money, it's the ECB in Europe, it's the Bank of England in the UK, the Bank of Japan, and, and so on. Every country is going through this COVID crisis and they are printing money to lend that money to companies. So at the end of the day, it's the scarcity of one currency versus another. So if everyone, every single central bank is printing money, maybe in relative terms, we are the same as before, even if there is more money there. So it's, it's a very good question. Thank you. Do we have, do we have any other questions, Tanya? Uh, Tani, I think your your m microphone it's it's mute. Sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, sorry. We have another lot. question from Andre. Yeah, I don't know. Are there solutions to break the mechanism of inflation due to the dollar? If if there are mechanisms to to break the the, the mechanism of inflation due to the dollar. So th yeah. this video of Dalia Ray, it's, it's, a, it's a long video and he explains the, the different possibilities, but at the end of the day, what you want is to become very competitive, right? Uh, the country level, say if it's Turkey that is living this inflationary depression and then the central bank of Turkey is printing money and, and the lira becomes more abundant, so even depreciates even more, but the debt is denominating dollars, so companies cannot pay the debt and so on. At some point, the lira is going to be so cheap that that foreigners, or foreign companies, or entrepreneurs are going to think, "Oh, now it's so cheap to buy this lira. So it's so cheap at the very end of the day to buy those companies, to buy those goods in Turkey." And when you have this differential, is when 
people start changing their dollars or euros for liras to do business in Turkey because there is blood in the industry. And when you have blood in the industry, you start the recovery. Everything was very, very cheap. And the same happening in, for example, in Spain during the great financial crisis in 2008 to 2013, we had this, what I called before, this mortgage crisis, people had mortgages, people were not able to pay, the same in the United States happened exactly the same. 2011, 12, like house, houses were super cheap in, in, in Spain, like very, very nice apartments in very nice streets, were like maybe 30% lower in value or 50% lower in value. So at that point, investors think, oh, that's a great opportunity. If I buy that house, maybe in five years, it's gonna double its price. So they choose their dollars for euros to buy real estate in Spain. And then they are buying euros, so the euro appreciates, there is more demand for the euros, the euros become scarcer, the euro appreciates, and things become more competitive and you will, will get out of the crisis. So another excellent question. Very good. And thank you for this very good question. Perfect. We have another question now from Pedro Diego. What do Pedro you think Diego. about the coronavirus situation? How do you think this affected every country's economy? Wow. So that's that's okay. a that's a big again a very very big question in terms of uh, so many things we can say, but. But if I have to say something in very short time, I think it's it's a uh, it's very dangerous. We are gonna we are living probably one of the worst financial crises or economic crises in history, very similar to the Great Depression. It can be even bigger than the Great Financial Crisis of 2008. It can cause massive unemployment. Companies have already huge amounts of corporate debt. Half of that is triple B, which means is is trash. Like it's it's very high likelihood of default. And when companies go bankrupt, they start firing people. So unemployment is gonna go up. And moreover, we have countries and governments with, that they issued a lot of government debt. So countries also have their own debt that is paid by the citizens. So the only way to pay that debt is to raise taxes. But if you raise taxes, you're gonna slow down the economy and you are gonna hurt the economy. So, and, and governments and countries may, may end up defaulting, not paying the debt. So you may have bank runs and very, very ugly situations. So if there is a second wave of coronavirus, uh, it's gonna be dramatic um, for real people. For, for us at the university, it, we are, you guys, students, me, faculty studying this program. It's, it's, it's a beautiful situation to study and discuss. It's, it's so exciting, like it's, it's a big problem in the world. And we are gonna spend time on that, uh, I'm sure of that. And, uh, and also I wanna say it's a huge opportunity at the same time. Everything is becoming digital. There is new technologies out there that people are really adopting in mass. And I think that even cities, the structure of cities is gonna change. And real estate, which is a, a very important sector, is gonna become crucial in this economy, in, in this new world, because like cities are gonna be restructured and if, like real estate as itself is an asset where people put the money in and so on. So there are, there are so many things that we can talk about, but I would say that it's very dangerous and it also poses it pose a very unique opportunity for the future. Um, we have, well, we have a lot of questions, so get ready for them. Uh, now we have a question from Gladys de Vidiers. Well, first she's telling you many thanks for this short, but very interesting case. Her question is, will the euro depreciate with the very significant monetary creation by the ECB that took place in the last month to support the financial market, e.g. pandemic purchase program? This has to do with the with the FED monetary policy question that that you answered before. Uh, and, and what is exactly the question? I understand it's about the European Central Bank printing money. And what is he asking? Exactly. Will the euro depreciate with the very significant monetary creation by the ECB that oh, took place in the last year? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, well. It's, it's an, uh, another good question. It's uh, if, if the ECB is printing money, the euro becomes more. 
I, I would ask you then, but you cannot speak now, but the answer is it's gonna become more abundant, right? If, if there is a bank printing money and this money is zeros, it becomes more abundant. So the euro depreciates. That's what we were dis discussing before. But it's gonna depreciate with respect to which currency because if, if it depreciates with respect to the dollar and the Federal Reserve is doing exactly the same as printing money, it's gonna only depreciate if the ECB is printing more euros than the Federal Reserve is printing dollars. So everything is in relative terms. The, the, the difficulty in currencies to understand pricing of currencies is that it's one currency versus the other. And you understand the scarcity of one currency versus the other. So if, if the euro becomes more abundant with respect to the dollar, because the ECB is, is like more aggressive, then yes, but, but we don't know that. And there is other potential reasons that maybe the, the US economy is doing better and no one wants to put their money in Europe because Europe is going to be a mess. And in, in, in that hypothetical case, people are going to withdraw. The, the, no one wants euros. So it's like the euro becomes abundant because no one wants euros and the euro is going to depreciate. So it depends on the situation. Okay, uh, I cannot see the questions, but I, because I have a very small screen uh, here, but Tania, I, I listen to you. Exactly. Well, uh, we have another comment and question from Marco Pellegrini. Uh, he no. says he, it's a very interesting presentation. Thanks. And he says that he has not studied these subjects and are more into marketing and digital trends, but like to learn about the correlated economic and finance matters. So he quest his question is, which resources will you suggest for someone who wants to learn the basic about these topics in simple ways like you just explained today? So which resources? Which resources? Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, at the SCP, at, in, 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 I mean, you, you um, what was the name of the student, sorry? Marco Pellegrini. Marco, Marco. So if, uh, if, if Marco ha wants to do marketing, okay, for example, he wants to, to he, he loves marketing, but he thinks like, he recognizes that to be a leader, he also needs to understand the economy and because he might be in charge of a company, whatever reason. So he then he enrolls in at the SCP and then he's going to take the macroeconomics class. So in macroeconomics, we are going to make sure that he's going to read books. We ask, uh, there's a, a very beautiful book, it's called House of Dead, it's beautiful, it's what I was teaching in the US, in many, the top universities are reading that book, it's, it's very easy, there is no, no theory, it's only about what we, I was doing today, like economic intuition, right, and the stories, so we are going to read books, we are going to read newspaper articles, we are going to comment on videos, and you're going to have the material that the professor is going to give you, and you don't have to do like this old-fashioned style of getting a, a thick book on macroeconomics and studying your you, this is ESCP is not about that it's ESCP is interactive okay so we're going to give you the material it's mo mostly about books articles and videos and case studies as well yeah perfect um well then we have a question from Ibrahim he asked if is is there the, a direct relation between difference of inflation rate and the exchange rate between the currencies of two countries? Is there a, do you, do you want me to read it again? Maybe? Uh, I almost got it, so yes, once more, yes. All right, is there a direct relation between difference of inflation rate and exchange rate between the currencies of two countries? Yeah, uh, Ibrahim, okay, uh, yes, the, the answer is yes. And uh, we, we this was one of the questions we were discussing at the very beginning, if you remember, we were talking about inflation. So for example, think about there is inflation in, in, in the UK, right? So it means that the prices in the UK are going up. And so the UK is becoming less competitive. So if they, they want to sell cars and suddenly there is inflation, the, 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 the price of British cars is going up. And Basically, you may have cars from, say, Germany that become relatively cheaper with respect to British cars because the inflation in the UK. So no one is gonna buy pound, no one is gonna sell their euros to buy pounds.
pounds and with those pounds they, no one basically wants to buy those cars because they are very expensive so understanding like differences in inflation between countries is very important also in terms of uh, exchange rate determination yes next question is by mark does the evolution of interest rates rates influence a repetitive economic crisis if if say it once more the, the you... does the evolution of interest rates influence the repetitive economic crisis uh yes and uh the reason is because interest rates are usually determined i mean they are determined by market forces but a big player in the market is the central bank the central bank is a monopoly and the central bank may decide to inject money uh, if there is more money in the in, in the economy the price of money is going to go down right money is abundant and if you want to borrow money they're going to have lower interest rate so interest rate is the price of money right so so the evolution of interest rates may, may cause a crisis or it's going to change the business cycle yes so for instance if the central bank in the united states the fed decides to print money inject money in the economy it's more more dollars right let's forget about exchange rates now we are going to talk about interest rates which is the price of money so if there is more dollars in the U.S. economy, if an American wants to borrow money to buy a car, because there is more money out there, it's more abundant, it's going to, the price of money is going to be cheaper, which means the interest rate is going to be lower. Okay, so the, and then more and more people are going to get credit and they are going to buy cars, they are going to buy houses and they are going to buy many things. So demand for U.S. products is going up, and this is going to boost the GDP, the gross domestic product. So the, the U.S. economy is going to boom because there is more credit. And uh, so this is an example where interest rates that are manipulated by the central bank may influence whether we are in a boom or in a bust. Okay. Um, now we have a question from Navanj. How do you think our employment is going to be affected? Asking this from the perspective of an international student. Employment, I mean, uh, well, employment. I yeah. guess that he's thinking about, uh, well, there's a difference between employment next in 2020, 2021, and employment in 2023. So if he's gonna, uh, he's a master's student or a bachelor's student? Um, I'm not quite sure to tell you the truth because I'm, I, I don't have the list here, but oh, well, it only says as an student. international student. No, international, international student. student. So let's let's assume you're a you're a bachelor student, which is basically why we are running this this show today. So if 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 you go to the market next academic year, which is 2020 2021, you're gonna have a tough time because what I was saying at the at some point in the presentation that. It's a huge crisis, very ugly. Things may get even worse. We are already at unprecedented levels of unemployment in mostly all countries uh, in, in the U.S. And uh, in the U.S., the effective unemployment rate, if you take into account also the people that have are in temporary unemployment because the companies decide to put them for three, five months on hold, it can, I, I remember it was around 32%. It's, huge unemployment for the US and in Spain kind of the same and other countries so if you want to find a job next year 2021 is not a good year but if it's 2023 which is when you finish your your bachelor 2023 2024 it's an exceptional year because this is we are going to get out of the crisis and and companies want to hire. There is money, optimists. People are excited to make money. The party starts again. People want to dance, and this is a very good time. So, I think you guys are very lucky that your study period is now during the crisis because this is the top situation in the market. Perfect. Very interesting. Uh, we have another question from Andre. Um, Andre. He says. I'm living in Ar in Argentina right now, and people are going crazy for dollars, but banks here are not selling anymore. Um, what does that actually mean? 
to Argentinas be concerned about their money being trapped in their own bank accounts? Uh, well, what does it mean? Like, it means that that people don't have trust uh, in Argentina's currency, and they they want to put their money in something that they are sure is not going to go down in in value. And usually, as I was saying before, is the dollar. So. Uh, and also the gold, you, you may want to buy gold. So gold, dollars is what people in times of a crisis, they, they sell whatever they have uh, and they buy that currency. And it means that uh, this is a problem for Argentina's banks because uh, people are moving their money outside the country and banks, they need to have reserves. Otherwise, there, there might be what is called a bank run. So, uh, the bank has not enough money to give back to, to the depositors of the money. And this is, again, a mess. Argentina went through several currency crises in, in the past. And um, as far as I know, it's also uh, going through a tough time these days. Uh, and it happens also in other countries. So, um, well, I mean, coming back to my uh, seminar class today, it's very important for you guys to understand change rates determination because if you may if, if if you put your money in a currency that at the end goes down and depreciates a lot because of a crisis that you are not able to see as a manager of your company you may lose like 50 60 percent of your of your of the of your all your money and only through carry through the change rate uh usually in business if you like gain like three percent it's like a big gain, you, you celebrate, right? I'm talking about 30% only because of exchange rate. So it, this is very important to understand. We have one more question, Tania? Yes, uh, yes? we actually okay. have two more questions, our last one. So yeah, okay. press one from Pedro Diego again. Do Pedro you consider, Diego. Pedro Diego, do you consider Pedro. Bitcoin a real car currency? What do you think about cryptocurrency? Do you think this will be stronger in the future? Well, it's a, a, another another fascinating topic, cryptocurrencies. And actually, we have a professor at ESCP Madrid that he's an expert also in cryptocurrencies, and he's also teaching about that. Uh, his name is Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba. And uh, but let me let me answer that question. Uh, cryptocurrency, they, they are currency because you can buy and sell things with that. But there are differences in the sense that there is no central bank behind that. The, the good aspects is that usually like cryptocurrencies are in limited supply, so that guarantees scarcity because it's limited. There is no central bank printing more. They usually go through algorithms and there is limited supply. So basically, it guarantees that the currency will not depreciate a lot. Um, uh, but of course, there are problems with with cryptocurrencies because um, uh, they may not have the trust of the people, and therefore, maybe at some point, you know, if people are scared, no one wants that currency. They are they are very risky at the same time. Okay, but yes, we, we may want to understand cryptocurrencies also in terms of scarcity once we understand the one understand the exchange rate. And then from for our last question from Ibrahim. Is the Ibrahim. difference of interest rates of money supplied by federal banks of two countries equal to the inflation rate? Is the difference of interest rates of money supplied by federal banks of two countries equal equal to the inflation rate? Yeah, I, I understand what, what what she means. So interest rates, interest rates, and inflation rates. So they are they are directly uh, related. There are some equations out there that we can study more theoretically uh, in class, but. What really matters is we, we cover that at some point, like for this class to make it like super intuitive to, for everyone that the, the goal, remember the goal of this class is to make it very intuitive uh, without equations and so on, is that if there is interest rate differential, there is gonna be an implication for exchange rates. For example, if think about that interest rates in Turkey increase a lot with respect to interest rates in the United States, what does it mean? It means that 
the, the, the price of money in Turkey is much higher than the price of money in the US. In other words, if you wanna basically borrow money in Turkey, you're gonna be charged a high interest rate. Why? Because it's very risky. You're in a, in a, in a depression. So if, you, if, if there is a lender and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with giving you my money, but you give me against that money a 20% interest rate. In the US, everything is safe, everything looks good. So if I wanna borrow money, there is a lot of people saying, well, it's, it's safe. So I am only gonna char charge you 2% interest rate. Uh, so the point is that this interest rate differential between the 2% interest rate in the US and the 20% in Turkey is gonna make that at some point, it's so attractive to get this if interest rate differential of 18% that people start trying to buy liras in Turkey to invest there. Why? Or to lend in Turkey. So the, 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 the game is the following. You are gonna borrow money at 2% interest rate in the US and you're gonna lend that money at 20% interest rate in Turkey. And you make the difference. It's free trade. It's like, it's, it's like free, free, it's arbitrage. And uh, if people start doing that, if investors and entrepreneurs, they notice, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a huge difference, uh, they are gonna start buying liras. And once they buy liras, the currency goes back to recovery. So that's, that's the short explanation. Okay, it, it, we actually, uh, this question arose another one. If you have just like two minutes to answer it, yeah, I think yeah, very, yeah, very happy. Yes. <laughs> this question is for Amandre and it says, what about negative interest rates like in Switzerland? Very good, uh, another, another fantastic question. And um, you guys who are gonna be very good students, I'm sure because of the questions you are asking. Uh, Negative interest rates, how can that be possible, possible right? If, if you go and say, I want to borrow like 1 million uh, euros, or I, let's, let's talk about Switzerland. I, I want to borrow 1 million francs, Swiss francs. And, and, and the lender says, that's fine. I, you, I'm going to give you that million Swiss francs. And in addition, I'm going to pay you the interest. So, it's not that the borrower pays the interest to the lender, it's the lender giving additional money to the borrower, which is crazy, right? Uh, if usually when you borrow money, you pay the, the interest, they, they charge you against that money. And, and why is that possible? Well, uh, it, it's, you, it, it can be possible because, um, it, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a reserve currency and people may want to have those Swiss francs in their hands. So they say, well, I'm gonna lend that money because they may, they may have financial investment. So they may say, well, I need Swiss francs to buy a house in Switzerland because this is the safest investment I have. But to have Swiss francs, I need to borrow Swiss francs. Uh, and uh, basically, maybe the lender thinks that uh, it can be a, it's, it's so safe to lend to that person because the collateral is so good that he says, uh, I'm fine. And, uh, and also another reason behind that that complements the story I'm saying is that the central bank is lending at, at, at negative interest rates in many cases. So at the end of the day, the commercial banks do this carry trade, this arbitrage. They, they, it might be negative interest rate with the central bank and also negative with the customers. Uh, and the diff, they, they think that there might be a difference. So, so that's the simple explanation. There can be other explanations if you talk about uh, repo markets. I will not talk about that, but I did my PhD dissertation of negative interest rates with, with repo transactions. Basically, it's, if you are gonna borrow a security against cash. So um, if the cash, if the security is very in high scarcity, everyone wants that security, say the stocks of uh, Volkswagen. Suddenly Volkswagen stocks become, everyone wants them. So they become scarce. So you might be willing to get, to borrow those shares of Volkswagen against a negative interest rate because you really need those shares. Why? Well, you, you, you promised to, 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 to give those shares to someone else and you don't have the shares by then and you are crazy otherwise you pay penalties. So you are willing to lend money against the shares at negative interest rates. That's also possible. But 
it's getting more complicated, but it's a very, very important and deep question. So thank you. Yeah. Tanya, are we good now? Yes. Um, yeah. They are just asking for another session like this. So, so <laughs> I think that's the best way to actually close the webinar. Thank you okay. very much, Jaime. It was really interesting. Oh, thank you, Tanya, for organizing this. It's my, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting the students. Yeah, I think uh, we will love to have you guys next year at ESCP if you're planning to come with us. Um, if not, we're, we're, well, we will be happy if you actually, you know, decide on coming to ESCP Europe or follow us and see all the events that we're going to be producing in the next months. Actually, this was our last ESCP Madrid Campus Masterclass and webinar for the semester. So I think we had, you know, like the best closing of all that we could consider. So thank you very much, Jaime. Thank you everyone for, for being with us today. And we hope to see you next very soon at the Madrid campus. Um, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Have a really nice evening, everyone. Thank you.